Um, I'll start with Ms. Rebecca Wilson. Yes, hello, Rebecca Wilson, faculty at Harrisville State University, and excited to be here with you all today. And I see Ms. Christy Jackson up next. So glad to be here. I'm a consulting partner with Mecca, and so glad, excited to be a part here for our inaugural Mecca <laughs> Lab series. <laughs> Ms. Sarah. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I am Sarah Westbrooks, and I serve as the project manager on the CIE MECA team. Glad to be here and can't wait to hear what you have to say, Michelle. I've been following your work, so you got a fan over here in this box. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Dr. Peppers. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Lisa Peppers, and I serve as the assistant dean in the Anheuser-Busch School of Business here at Harris Stowe. And I am an alum with Ms. Michelle Robinson, so I am excited to see her dreams manifest today. <laughs> Welcome. That's awesome. And I am Dr. Stacey Hollins, and I have the honor of serving as the Dean of the Anheuser-Busch School of Business here at the illustrious Aristotle State University. With that said, I am excited to hear from today's dynamic speaker, Ms. Michelle Robinson, owner of Demi Blue Natural Nails. Michelle is the owner of Demi Blue Natural Nails and the creator of Demi Blue 10 Free vegan friendly nail polish brand. She has serviced the healthcare and education industries for over 18 years. Michelle has an MBA in business administration as just mentioned by Dr. Peppers and a BA in organizational development. She is a registered medical assistant and a licensed manicurist. Michelle was awarded the brand of the year in 2020 and has received over 100K in business grants. Inspired by her cancer surviving mom and her mom's healing journey, Demi Blue was created. Witnessing her mom struggle to find nail polish products that did not have a harsh chemical, uh, harsh chemicals ultimately affected her ability to express her bubbly personality through her usual um, nail routine, which we are all familiar with. What started as a desire to help Michelle's mom through the creation of this personal nail polish brand, Demi Blue, is now disrupt disrupting the nail care industry by educating women of these toxic chemicals and offering a better and healthier choice, which is what we all see. Michelle, thank you so much for agreeing to kick, up, kick off our inaugural lab series today. And with that, take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Stacey G. Hollins. I appreciate your wonderful introduction. You did a great job. I think you, that sums it up right there, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> I do appreciate this opportunity to speak to um, your alum, your class, and the community today about um, my journey on entrepreneurship and um, just kind of give some tips on uh, how I started, where it all began, and how to turn your idea into a, a successful brand. Um, as mentioned by Dr. Stacy G. Hollins, um, I did start my career in healthcare and education. Uh, I had no idea that I would transition into entrepreneurship and had no idea that nail polish would be the avenue that would take me there. So I wanna talk a little bit about that journey um, because uh, it, it, it just really is a testament of how the things that we love to do and the things that we're destined to do can definitely turn into our passion and the things that make us great business um, individuals. And so, yes, I spent 11 years at Washington University as a clinical administrator. I then transitioned into education where I taught at the proprietary sector um, for seven years. Um, I taught healthcare courses. I created that content. Um, and in that time frame, I, I thought about entrepreneurship, right? What, what is it that I could do to, to branch off into my own business? Um, because I often found myself dedicating 12 to 14 hours in corporate America and saying, hey, I can do something like this on my own, um, but not really knowing what that looked like. Um, and so I, I had all these ideas, right? I thought I was gonna be a, a singer, right? Cause in high school, you know, I went to a visual performing arts high school. I wanted to be a singer and that career was short lived. <laughs> so 
so then uh, I thought about, well, what am I really good at, right? What are some of the things that I'm, I'm really good at as a person? And then I thought about um, decorating because I'm very systematic. I like to decorate. I like things in order. So I started this, you know, M Style Matters interior design business, right? And I partnered with banks and realtors and I staged homes and um, I went into, you know, local celebrity homes and staged their homes. And, and then that was short lived. And so I'm like, okay, this isn't the cup of tea that I thought it would be. What is it that I'm supposed to do, right? In life outside of the healthcare industry, outside of education. I really wanted to do something on my own. Um, and in 2010, my mom was diagnosed with cancer. And I remember having a conversation with her. She, she, was, come, she was living with me at the time and she was coming up the stairs. And, and I just asked her, mom, why aren't you painting your nails? And she said, well, I can't use regular nail polish. It has stuff in it. You know, she says stuff. It has stuff in it that you know, it's irritating my nails, it's causing, you know, sensitivity, it burns, it tingles. And it was almost like a light went off, right? It was just like, what? You can't use nail polish? You know, my, my mom expresses her personality through her fashion. And I watched her use nail polish and use makeup and wear her, you know, jewelry and, and her fashion to really express herself. And, and I noticed she wasn't wearing nail polish. And so, I immediately dug into that industry. What is it that my mom who, who has had cancer, who has undergone radiation, why can't she use nail polish? And so next slide, I, I decided to, to tap into what I thought could be a great niche uh, for me. I, I tried to discover what it would be that I would be good at transitioning into the cosmetic industry. Um, and so I, I read this article and I, I'm sharing it with you guys because as, as future entrepreneurs or current entrepreneurs, it's important to discover really what your niche is when you're going into business and what is it that, what problem are you solving or what is it that you're trying to accomplish when you're creating a, a business as a, as a small business owner and how you can be unique in that particular business. And so next slide, I decided nail polish was going to be my why. It was gonna be my why because of my mom's experience with cancer, because her inability to use conventional nail polishes and because of the toxins that we know are considered uh, uh, carcinogens or agents that are linked to cancer like the toxic trio. How many of us have been warned to, to avoid these toxins in our general cosmetics, right? Formaldehydes and, and dibutylphosphate. These are toxins that we've been warned about, right? But we've not been warned about so many others. And so as I was conducting my research and trying to find the perfect nail polish for my mom, I saw that there was a, some missing parts, right? Nail polishes that were, that spoke to my mom's personality, first of all, nail polishes that were healthier in that they offered nutrients and vitamins and education around cancer and toxins. And that just wasn't something that I saw consistently. And so what started as a, an idea to offer my mom a healthier product, I thought I can use my background in healthcare. I can use my education. I can create this product that can really impact the community of women who are targeted in cosmetics, but are not educated of the toxins, who don't have that access and create a healthier brand. And so that's how we started Demi Blue. It has since been my mission to provide a clean line of nail polish products um, to educate women and to support women who not only have undergone cancer and radiation, but who are health conscious and want a healthier brand. Next slide. So I had this great product, now what, right? How did, I, how did I get started, right? Because oftentimes we have this great idea and we have this, um, you know, this, this, this idea of what we think we want our brand or our business to look like, but we really don't know the steps. We really don't have a clue how to get started. So I posed some questions here 
for myself and then just some things that I wanted to share with you guys um, because I know a lot of businesses that are starting up now are our you know, product based, if we're really tapping into our health, we're really being more health conscious. And there's a lot of people starting uh, product based businesses. Um, and these are a few things that I jotted down that I, that I took the time to research and thought it was important to introduce to, to new entrepreneurs who are looking to start a brand. You know, how do I, how do I start the business? Well, first and foremost, protect your business by incorporating it, whatever that looks like for you, you know, speak with an attorney, um, make sure that you're incorporating your business that makes sense to you. Um, and, and to trademark my brand and my product, that was the two first things that I worked on when starting my business was protection, protecting it legally um, by creating an organization or LLC, and then uh, applying for my trademark of my product and of my brand name. That was two separate uh, applications that I had to, to submit to make sure that I was protected. And then also because it's a product and because it deals with chemicals, I wanted to make sure that I covered um, my business by getting insurance, right? Product insurance, brand insurance, it's important to have insurance because people are using your product. Um, and we are in a so happy environment, <laughs> right? I wanted to make sure that my product was covered and protected. Um, from any type of uh, issues that may cause us to, uh, to be at liability. Um, and I wanted to make sure that I was protecting the message also that I had of this brand. Um, I researched the target market to see who would best benefit from this product. So of course my mom and, and a community of women who have had cancer or who have undergone radiation treatment the vegan community because they're very committed to being health conscious. Um, you know, our naturalists, our health enthusiasts, those were my target market. Um, and then I see that, you know, our millennials are really into being health conscious. They really want to make sure they're avoiding some of these toxic chemicals. So understanding who your market is, uh, is very important. Um, I took the opportunity to pitch my products to everyone that I encountered. If you were in the elevator with me, I was pitching my product. If you were in the grocery store with me, I was pitching my product. If there was an event, I was there um, pitching my product. Um, and so I, I took the time to really make sure that I was getting the opportunity to tell everyone that I encountered about this product and the importance of being conscious of the chemicals that we're using um, on our skin and in our bodies. Um, and then taking time to understand my margins, right? That's important. Understanding uh, who I was selling to, um, how to price my products, and how to ensure future growth for the sale of my products. Um, understanding the requirements and the regulation of my product category. A lot of times we see people starting a, a product-based business and they're selling at vendor events or they're selling online and they're not taking the time to make sure that they're understanding the Federal Trade Commission regulations, that they're not protecting their brand, that they, that they don't have all of the most important small details uh, in line. And so I wanted to make sure I touched on that because it's more than just creating a product and selling it. It's about protecting your brand, protecting your customers, and then being able to educate on the use and, and the viability of that product. Um, I think one of the things that I want to make sure I point out here is that I labeled this slide inception to outcome. And a lot of times um, people say, well, inception is the start of something, but the completion is the end. Um, and in branding and in marketing and in business, there's never an end, right? You're always reinventing ways to make your product better or make your business better. Um, or make you know your educational piece better. And so I wanted to make sure I highlighted that, that um, starting a business is never a beginning and never an end. It's a full cycle of movement to make sure that you're producing the best and you're constantly growing. Um, and then I always tell people to shoot your shot, right? You never know who's in the room. That's why I pitch everywhere I go. You never know who's in the room. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. 
I, I thought it was important to, to share the current retailers that I currently have because in just one short year, we've landed almost um, 20, 25 retailers. Um, we have over 50 plus wholesale transactions and we're, um, we've partnered with 12 subscription box retailers because I wasn't afraid to shoot my shot. Um, I would cold call, I would go into certain, you know, boutiques or stores and say, hey, I've got this product. And I think you're missing a market of health conscious individuals if you don't carry it, <laughs> right? Being very bold and being very courageous, but also um, being informative and prepared. Um, when I went into these opportunities, I took sales sheets. I took information, I left that information with them. I created an educational package that allowed me to not only pitch my brand to the owner or to the salesperson, but to leave some follow through information so that they would have uh, something to read on and something to say, okay, yeah, I see that she's serious. I see that she's prepared. And this is probably a, a brand that would make a really good impact in, in this market. Um, and so being prepared in that arena is very important. Um, but yeah, I, I never thought that nail polish would be the track of entrepreneurship that I would be on, but it definitely was a call to action. And it definitely was a, a full circle of life events that led me to, to make this a very passion point in my career. Um, and now, so- Quick, quick question. Well, do you think you were always entrepreneurial um, from the beginning? It sounds like you were because you were always trying something. And do you Absolutely. think that this will always evolve to something else or is it nails for you? Absolutely. It definitely, I feel like um, entrepreneurship has been something that was, was growing in me all along um, because the leadership roles that I held in corporate America um, and then things that I did in the community outside of, you know, my corporate roles kind of led me to, to where I am now. And yes, nails is a stepping stone, but I still am evolving and, and, and using my past experiences to further my entrepreneurial journey into, into consulting and educational sectors and just again still really using all of my past experiences to grow my business um nail polish is is just like i said a stepping stone i think that there's room for me to grow into some additional cosmetics i think there's room for me to to educate entrepreneurs who are looking to start their own business i think it's room for me to go back into the healthcare systems and speak from a cosmetic standpoint, right? From the chemistry and anatomy of it all. Um, so yeah, it's an ever growing uh, possibility. Yeah. We can move to the next slide. I always have to shout, you know, pump myself up and shout myself out. I think it's important to celebrate your wins. Um, I wanted to take time to just kind of show um, that although I didn't see nail polish as being a place for me in the cosmetic industry, I think others saw validity in that brand. And it was important to share um, this journey and why um, my business is so community driven and so um, needed. And so these are just some opportunities that I've had to share and to educate um, the community and, and some growing uh, business opportunities here. And I wanted to pump myself up because oftentimes we don't do that. And oftentimes we, we don't see our growth. Um, and so um, this little slide was important. So I can always reflect on, yes, Michelle, your product has meaning. Yes, Michelle, you, um, you have validity in this industry and it's needed. Um, so the next slide is just an opportunity for individuals to, to reach out to me, to contact me. If there's any questions on entrepreneurship, if they wanna learn anything more about nail polish or the chemicals that make them up, um, I definitely have opportunities for individuals to reach out. I do have mentoring um, opportunities that, um, 
uh, that I offer. Um, so yeah, I'm open to questions and comments or any feedback that you guys have. Yes, I have a question. Can I be heard? I'm sorry. You can be heard, Mr. Barnett. Thank you very much. Um, where do you see your company in the next five years? That's a great question. I, I definitely uh, see continuous growth. We're currently partnering with some uh, major retailers. Um, I see Demi Blue and Target. <laughs> I see Demi Blue as a household name. Um, I see my company involved in educational symposiums where um, we're partnering with organizations uh, with cancer um, and educating women on resources and um, providing support um, in regards to ensuring that they have what they need to uh, transition into healthier uh, lifestyles in regards to the, what they're eating, uh, the cosmetics that they're using, um, and just really being a, a pillar in the community with this brand. Michelle, your, your, story, your story sounds so wonderful, exciting. Entrepreneurs are like, let's go. Um, what would you tell us about some of the challenges you've encountered about walking into those stores and handing them your sales sheet and not feeling like you were being heard or anything like that? Absolutely. So let's talk first about the challenges. Um, because nail polish was not my original industry, there was a lot that I had to learn. Um, it took a lot of convincing people that I knew what I was talking about from a healthcare standpoint and not the cosmetic industry standpoint. I had to earn that trust. Um, and I did that by conducting the research and really inserting myself in creating this, this brand um, wholeheartedly and then tying it into my knowledge of healthcare. Um, and I learned that not everyone is my customer, but every opportunity that I have to present this product, I'm going to take that and know that I've educated you and that you may not be my particular customer, but you may know someone who is. And so I always take every encounter as an opportunity, right? Um, and understanding that just because I'm prepared doesn't mean that that person's prepared to receive. And that's okay. I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna show up again. <laughs> I'm going to follow through. And then if you're not my customer, maybe ask you to link me to someone who, who could potentially be. So it's about you know being steadfast and consistent and following through. How did you uh, market your product uh, besides the elevator pitch or um, going uh, to the store, uh, telling people about your product? How, how else did you market your product? Uh, Mr. Dent, I was everywhere. I participated in vendor events. I did pop-up events. Um, I conducted email campaigns. I created a team of brand ambassadors. I... Um, Social media, of course, right? I'm constantly posting on LinkedIn. I utilize um, Canva to create that con content and post on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I take advantage of every resource that I possibly could. Um, and I'm learning as I go because Canva has really <laughs> been uh, challenging for me, but I take the time to learn how to use it uh, because it has a lot of tools and resources. And so Canva has been very, um, a very great tool to help me create content and then to share that content over social media. Um, but yeah, just utilizing um, the resources that are available to me and then word of mouth, you know, asking people to share with the people that they know, um, you know, taking advantage of media opportunities, taking advantage of print opportunities and just really uh, staying aggressive on getting the message out there. Michelle, it seems like 
um, often the struggle for entrepreneurs is exactly what you're talking about. Usually you're good at what you're good at. The cooks, the chefs are good at being cooks and chefs, uh, the, um, you know, whatever the business might be, they're good at that. But, you know, technology is new for a lot of people. And yes. there are people that have some great ideas and are excellent at what they do, but not the knowledge and skills to, to maneuver in this highly technical uh, marketing world. So do you have suggestions for those folks? Absolutely. Um, a couple suggestions. Don't be afraid to learn new things. Second, use the people around you to help you. It's okay to ask for help. If you know someone who's good at graphic design, or if you know someone who's, you know, good at social media, using the people around you, asking for help, uh, getting tapped into the ecosystem, the St. Louis ecosystem and finding out what resources are available and showing up and taking advantage of those resources. Um, like Ms. Christy Jackson and Mecca and some of the other organizations that offer entrepreneurship trainings and um, you know resources and tools and workshops. It, it's gonna take a little time out of your day, but those workshops can, if you don't have the money to pay someone to do these things for you, it definitely puts the ball in your hand and allows you to build um, as you continue to build financially. All right, we have some questions in the chat. So we're gonna pitch to you, Miss Michelle, and see what we got uh -huh. here. Um, let me see, let me see if I can start up a little bit higher. How did you perform your research and what did your iteration process look like? Um, so, um, I first started doing research just kind of online, right? Just researching beauty cosmetic brands or nail polish brands, what was already out there. Um, what could I you know, introduce to my mom or what could I insert myself as probably a, a distributor myself? Um, and like I said, I didn't find brands that matched my mom's personality in regards to her expression on fashion, the colors and things like that. And I did not find brands that offered healthier options in regards to building the natural nail and hydrating the natural nail and, and eliminating those toxins that were, were linked to cancer. Again, a part of her uh, remission plan was to avoid these toxins. And so, um, I started there and then I partnered with an environmental and cosmetic chemist um, because of course my background wasn't, wasn't chemistry per se in, in cosmetic development, um, but I, I researched that concept and then I partnered with people who did it, right? So I hired an environmental chemist and a cosmetic chemist. And then I started to research manufacturers after we created this formulation of what we wanted this nail polish to look like. Then I started to research manufacturers, individuals who only created or helped to create um, clean cosmetics. I wanted to make sure there was no cross-contamination with developing and packaging my product. So I researched online, I visited a few manufacturers and I found a manufacturer in the US um, that would bottle now this product. Um, and this manufacturer also helped me with labeling. And so it was, it was it was definitely, and I think I have a picture on one of the slides where I started out bottling this stuff myself. The bottles had little stickers on them. And it was, hey, I ran with it and it worked. <laughs> and then I just continued to build and, and continue to grow. And I researched, you know, uh, brands that were out there and the packaging that they used and, and the images that they used and what was on the shelves and the stores and what I wanted my product to look like. And, eventually transitioned to that. It sounds like you spent a lot of, a lot of time before you even got started. Um, yes, your research, yes, which is yeah. Great. So the product has been on the market for, uh, I will say two and a half years, but I say three years because of, uh, of calendar years. We rolled out our product October, 2018. Um, in October, so October to October 2021 is three years. And in that time, it took me two years to, to do focus group events and surveys and product surveys and 
um, I had the community actually, St. Louis community came together. They helped me select colors. They helped me name the nail polish. They helped me with packaging um, through those focus group events. And then I surveyed, how much would you pay for this nail polish? How much would you, you know, what, what would you want it to smell like? You know, different things like that to make sure that I was catering to um, the, my potential customers. And so that was a process of two years. So technically five years working to get this product where it is now, and we're still growing and we're still, you know, looking at ways to improve our brand image. I think it's so vital for, for our budding entrepreneurs to understand that you don't just start a business and you're immediately successful. We see Michelle of Demi Blue everywhere now, all yes. that picture you showed us, <laughs> and they don't realize that you actually spent two years building that before you even put something yes. out on the market. So that's yes. Cool. I got a good and one from um, Corrine Arrington asked, were you afraid of being rejected? Absolutely. Um, I think we all have a, a human, our human nature uh, is to, to fear rejection, but um, I was so passionate. I, I was so, it was almost like I was angry <laughs> um, because I felt like our community um, is often misrepresented. We're over-targeted and uh, in the cosmetic industry, yet no one is educating us or providing us with healthier options. And I was angry um, because I watched my mom lose a little bit of her self-confidence, not being able to commit to or express herself through her fashion. It is important for some women to really have all of those little things. And there weren't any options. There weren't a lot of options for her. And so I was angry. I was like, I'm going to get this nail polish in front of everyone. And I want everyone. And yes, there was fear of rejection because there is an industry that loves, you know, acrylic nails. And there's a push for instant gratification and instant satisfaction. And, um, you know, my nail polish in my system takes a little time. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yes, there was rejection. But again, I understood that not everyone was my customer. And that if I had an opportunity to educate you, that I was doing my part. And I would say passion. That's not anger. That's passion. Yeah. <laughs> You're passionate about making change in this world, what you've done. Yeah. Um, Thank you for answering my question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Christy uh, asked, how did you pace your business growth and what metrics did you use to decide? Yeah, so I definitely used um, some key performance indicators, right? I, I wanted to make sure that I, uh, understood what I was looking for in my, in my brand that would help me determine what growth looked like, right? Um, so um, I, I wanna say I, I did start small, I did start slowly. I started with boutique style um, retailers on commission, I'm sorry, not on commission, on consignment. And so I started there just to kind of test how sales would go. Um, I placed my product in three retailers here in St. Louis, like I said, on consignment, whatever um, products sold, they got a percentage of it, and then we got a percentage of it. And so I use that um, those as some key indicators to see, I think my, my AirPods just tapped out. Can you guys we can hear you? We can. Awesome. Um, and so I use that. I, so I use that um, as an opportunity to, to, to say, okay, will my nail polish grow from a consignment standpoint? Am I re ready for wholesale? Am I ready for um, big box retailers? Um, let's see how sales go there. And so that was, that was one. And then we transitioned into wholesale opportunities. We opened our business, our products up for uh, retailers to buy at wholesale. So then, so we significantly, um, lower the price so that uh, sellers or, or buyers could buy in bulk um, and then they could resell in their storefronts. And so I looked at the, um, the growth of or the scale of sale there. Um, I looked at my analytics from social media and reaching out to these potential wholesalers to see who I was reaching 
um, as a key uh, performance indicator. And then of course sales is, uh, is, is, uh, is a matrix that we use. How, you know, how are sales? What's the turn key on this product? How fast are they selling? How fast am I reordering? And how, and, and are these resellers reordering from me? Which means that they're doing a great job and they're brick and mortar selling my product and the product is showing uh, viability in their stores. That's awesome. When I keep hearing this reoccurring theme. I keep thinking about our, you know, Mecca is here to serve all entrepreneurs and they're, you know, that very small one person sitting in a room by themselves trying to figure it out. I keep hearing this reoccurring theme that you've pl placed the seed in my mind that if you don't know it, find people who do and reach out. We really intend to bring all those resources together in Mecca and keep saying, um, well, we don't have somebody who knows how to do data analytics. Where is that person and how do we plug them into Mecca? Because we do want to provide those. You have such a great vast knowledge of research because you've taken the time to do the work. Yeah. And not everybody has that time, but they do have a talent. And we want to make sure that um, it, those things that you just mentioned, how do you tell um, if I'm doing right, if I'm doing the right things in this market? How do I know when to make a change or when to grow? So yeah. this is just so very helpful. I'm just very excited about what, what everybody's learning from you. So the next question comes from Mr. Den. I think he's asking, this was born of your love of your mother and trying to help her with cancer, um, it, but it's all natural. So are you expanding beyond um, people who uh, have cancer and, and because it's all natural, what other kind of markets are you looking at? Um, absolutely. Uh, originally, I, I targeted a particular market because that's kind of where the inception of the brand came from, right? Um, really trying to hone in on the importance of us looking at the chemicals and how they impact our body. And so that, for me, that health conscious in, environment that those, ca those cancer survivors were very key in getting the product out there, right? Um, in that, in that uh, arena. Um, of course, I think that there's going to always be a need and a push to, to, to identify that we're moving into an environment of clean, cleaner and healthier cosmetics. So that'll always be the push. Um, I don't think that I'm going to get away from that, but um, I'm always looking to research how we can enter into other markets, of course. That's, that's kind of the, the completion or, or outcome uh, that we're moving to, to make sure that we're looking at other markets, we're continuing to understand the growth and the trends, and then making sure we're positioning ourselves to, to be inserted in those markets. Perfect. You got a lot of questions, so I'm keeping it moving on. Okay. <laughs> uh, Mr. McCance wants to know, you were a recipient of the UMSL Accelerator. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. What are some pros and cons that you learned um, during that process and after receiving that grant? Uh, well, the pros was I won $50,000. <laughs> that was a pro. Um, also, one of the pros was the, the connections of people, right? The mentors. I have two mentors, um, even after that program ended, that are still meeting with me once a month, still helping me with the growth of my business and giving me advice and tips. That is important because I serve as a mentor, but I also need mentorship as well. And so we all can continue to learn. And so the importance of uh, cultivating relationships from that opportunity was key. Um, the cons, I would say, are positives for me because it helped me to tap into areas of my business that I was weak in. And it forced me to pay attention to my numbers, my financials, um, my, um, it forced me to, to look into my supply chain management processes, things that I did not consider. You just think, oh, I created this product and I'm just going to push it out to everyone, but not really paying attention to tracking my inventories and, and tracking my supply chain management and tracking my financials and allowing my financials to tell me how to run my business. Um, that's something that is crucial because analytics will tell you only so much. But your financials will tell you a lot. 
Um, it tells you what's working, what's not working, what to invest in and what to pull back from. And so I never paid attention. I'm not going to say I never paid attention. I didn't pay as much attention because I was in the grind. And so having that type of uh, accelerator that s- slows you down in your movement and say, hey, let's look at your financials and let's turn your weaknesses into some strengths. And so that um, to me really wasn't a con. It, it, it was a con and shame on me that I wasn't doing that. But now I am doing it. And now I'm, I'm seeing areas of my business where I can grow. I tell students all the time, my biggest learning comes from my mistakes. Yes. I, I learned the most uh, when I'm trying to figure something out and I have to do it on my own or from a mistake I made. So it's a good, exactly. good point. Um, Ms. Joyce wants to know if Marketplace will be an opening to Amazon. Um, so the Walmart Marketplace? Yes. Um, so I, I've thought about Amazon and I'm, I'm really uh teeter toddling <laughs> on that i think that transitioning to shopify may be a better transition for me right now um i think that there is a war between shopify and amazon and i'm trying to see which side i want to be on <laughs> <laughs> is it like an apple um uh, like an iphone uh... <laughs> like an apple hp thing yeah <laughs> I'm still fighting between Apple and HP, but yeah, (laughs) it's just a matter of determining which platform works best for, uh, you know, what you're potentially trying to achieve. And, um, and I'm still just kind of weighing my options there and, and getting a grasp for (laughs) these platforms because Walmart, I feel like, uh, gave me an opportunity to see how a larger platform would help me build my business to, to a mass uh, audience that I probably wouldn't have reached outside of that. So just uh, not moving too fast. I'm taking my time, I'm seeing what works and I'm going into platforms that that uh, really help me do what I'm trying to, to do in business. You still doing your research? I'm still, still doing my research. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Uh, Chrissy wants to know, looking back, what do you wish that you knew when you were starting up? Um, I wish I did not have the assumption that leaving corporate America working 12 to 14 hours wouldn't be the same as coming into entrepreneurship and working 12 to 14 hours <laughs> because I still put in the time, but the gratification is so much, it's so much more um, because it's, it's mine, mm-hmm. right? I'm able to, to help other people. I'm able to see my work flourish. I'm able to make an impact and, and the, the level of satisfaction for me is different. I had a level of satisfaction in corporate America because I was educating students. I was helping people in healthcare, um, but then I was going home and waking back up and doing the same thing for other people. And I wanted to do something for myself. And so um, I, I, I assumed that it would be better, right? I assumed I could work two hours and, then, and kick it for the rest of the day. <laughs> You hear that, scholars? Do you hear that? <laughs> and community. I, I promise you, I probably work longer now than I did before. But isn't it, isn't it amazing the purpose and the passion and how it drives you? And we 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 work in that purpose and passion and walk out of this building exhausted, yes. and then say, "I can't wait to do it again tomorrow," exactly. because we know it's all about the scholars. It's all about the you know. So that purpose and passion will definitely give you the energy you need to sustain. It's yes. amazing. Absolutely. All right, I'll do one more and then we'll decide what we'll do next together. Uh, Dr. Peppers would like to know if there's any plan um, for plans for a push for the holidays. Do you think do anything with um, awareness months like this is breast cancer awareness month? So oh great question, Dr. Pepper. <laughs> Dr. Pepper, that's why I like. Uh-huh. Um, so yes, we, we definitely have a social uh, responsibility component to our business. Um, it is, it is our, my true mission to make sure that I am making an impact in my community. And so for, in October, we have what's called the Demi Blue Cares Initiative. And what we do is um, we, we highlight and we um, honor ca- cancer survivors. Um, we provide them with nail, free nail polishes. Um, prior to COVID, we were going into Washington University and some of the healthcare centers and providing free manicures. 
Um, since COVID, we haven't really been able to get in those facilities. We're hoping to, to do that again uh, soon, but um, uh, we do send out mail care kits, uh, informational kits. We partner with uh, cancer organizations. Like this year, we're partnered with the Physicians Committee um, and, and uh, we're sending out uh, informational packets in our shipments. And uh, we really want to make sure that we're getting products out to these survivors and we're shouting them out on social media and we're, um, you know, really celebrating them because they, they, you know, endure a journey with breast cancer and it's a lifelong journey once they're diagnosed. Um, and so we want to make sure that they are getting healthier products and they're getting education from myself, as well as uh, some of the organizations that we partner with. Uh, for the holidays, um, we're gearing up for the holidays. We are, you know, putting together holiday kits. I wanted to invite the community into some of my family traditions. One of my family traditions is uh, every year, we, we select an ornament um, from wherever, like we, we'll go to a store or we'll go visit a place and we'll get an ornament and we'll put that particular ornament on the tree. So for over 26 years, all of the ornaments on my tree are from friends and family who have given ornaments and placed them on our tree. We don't have a lot of store-bought ornaments on our Christmas tree. And so as part of that tradition, I've added a Demi Blue ornament to our holiday uh, sets. And so when you order from Demi Blue this holiday season, you'll get one of our ornaments. Um, they are a reflection of the colors of our nail polish. They are just the most adorable ornament, but you will become a part of our tradition uh, this holiday when you order from us with those ornaments. Are you still doing focus groups even now that you've stood up the, the um, business, Michelle? So I'll, I'll do a focus group event in 2022. I plan on rolling out uh, a new product in 2022. So the focus groups um, help me to, you know, validate this particular product. And we normally do them in person um, because I want them to touch, smell, see, you know, and give feedback. And so I'm hoping that in the spring of 2022 that we can gather um, and I'll get creative. Um, on that and allow the community to come back into those focus group uh, sessions. Well, keep us in mind. We'll make sure you have everyone's name. We'll help <laughs> you with your focus group. Yes. Um, and then I think I'll ask the last question because this is a pretty unique situation um, from Christy. How have you overcome the funding, access to capital and equities um, that female entrepreneurs face? Oh, wow. That's a, that's a good question, uh, Christy. Um, I don't, I won't say I over, I have overcome them. We, we continue to face them. Um, because I'm a researcher and because I have tapped into St. Louis's ecosystem, the community has really afforded me a lot of opportunities to find grants and to apply for those grants. I think it's important that people understand that there, there are some opportunities out there, but you have to be persistent and consistent in following through with those opportunities. The grant applications can be timely and tedious and they ask a lot of probing questions about your business. But I say apply and don't give up because you never know, you could be a recipient. And so researching those opportunities, tapping into the ecosystems. Um, for me, it was a little different because um, I started this process while I was still working. And so I allowed my, uh, my uh, employer to be my first investor. And so after I was done paying my bills, I put money towards my business. So I tell people, don't quit your daytime job, use that employer as your investor. And then, um, you know, I, research opportunities. I apply for accelerators, I apply for grants. Um, and it is still a, a despairing amount of opportunities for us. Um, but I feel like I'm in a position now where I'm using um, my sales profit to reinvest in my business. The, when they say business owners don't make money in the first five years, they are not lying. I, every dime that I make, I invest right back into my business. And so this year, 
2021 was the first year that I saw profit that I was able to say, I'll put this in the bank. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to pay myself, right? Because I haven't paid myself. I, 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 every dime I put right back into the business, I haven't paid myself. And so this year I said, okay, I'm going to pay myself a little something, put that in the bank just to show myself that I earned a little something. But then, you know, reinvesting everything else and continuing to, to push through and find opportunities for funding. So they do, they mean it when they say you have to spend money to make money. Yes. You just have to do it. Absolutely. But you're investing in yourself and in making the community better. So that's Absolutely. awesome. Awesome. And, 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 and eventually um, it does pay off. It does pay off. It really does. And, and, and the money will come. Yes. Well, I have truly enjoyed you today. I hope that everyone else has. Uh, we were going to break out into groups, but you had so many questions from the audience <laughs> that we didn't get to do that, which even worked out better because everybody got to hear your true story and get all their answers, all their questions answered. So we thank you for giving us your valuable time because you had all that research you could have been doing right now. You were with <laughs> us sharing with our scholars and our community, and we appreciate you. We thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. You all that are, have attended, we truly appreciate you taking an hour of your time with us and Mecca. Please register for our next speaker, uh, Dr. Q, um, the dentist. He has a pretty cool process like uh, Ms. Michelle's um, and a pretty cool uh, product that he'll be sharing how he created his product as well. So uh, make sure to register at hssu.edu slash Mecca for our next series, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.